keeper. I can tunes uh, because I spend a fair bit of time in the bushes, the uh, the application and when are you gonna halt its uh, application of 1080, which seems to be a big responsibility in our food chain and also threat to our environment. So uh, if I uh, got the question right, uh, the question was around when are we going to halt the application of 1080? So I guess uh, the short answer to that is, uh, if you look at the work that the ZIP team are doing around 1080 to zero, uh, and then if you look at New Zealand's context, particularly a deep bush context, we're realistically doing large areas of tens of thousands of hectares with ground-based techniques uh, is just simply, uh, in many cases, not safe and not cost effective. So we've got clearly a pathway the ZIP team are going on in terms of using 1080 but only having to use it once and then protecting that area uh, forever. Uh, and then you've got the reality of New Zealand's bush context where ground control just won't do it sometimes. So I can see over the course of the next uh, two to three decades uh, a transition uh, with 1080 being used but used increasingly uh, really as we start to roll out uh, eradication on deep bush areas uh, and the protection of those over time. You might want to comment. <laughs> no, no, that's that's as good as answer as you're going to get at this time of, at this time because that's that's the reality we're in. I mean, that is a tool that we need to use in some situations, and unfortunately, that's going to continue to be the case for a while yet. In, in the road, in the sense of. No, I'm not sure I understand your question. In, in the terms of the 1680. All right, thanks for your view. Appreciate it. Uh, Liz McGrady, Federated Farmers. Um, I've been um, hugely encouraged um, the last couple of days um, by yeah. the um, the work that's been done to take the vision and 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 convert it to um, practical implementation program. I see a lot of work around spatial temporal targeting, species targeting. Um, it's awesome. Um, perhaps a question yesterday we heard from, I think it was the Predator Free um, 2050 guy who had just received 40 odd bids from around the country and his estimate was that, um, that um, if, if they all got signed off there was maybe $50 million per annum involved. Um, I am wondering um, whether um, that $50 million might perhaps be based on um, what we've been doing yesterday. Uh, and, and, and maybe not what we might be doing um, next year or in, in two or five years' time. So um, perhaps a, a, probably my question is um, what might be involved in um, pulling together all these um, threads uh, to um, uh, update um, the projections and uh, in, in the costs in terms of what might be achievable um, a little bit more rapidly. Um, so I'll go first. <laughs> um, so to be perfectly honest, that question is probably best given to Predator Free 2050, but as I understand it, the process is such that they are looking through those bids with that very lens that you are talking about, which is going, where are we at right now in terms of the technology, what technology is coming and is either here tomorrow or is further away on the horizon and how does that shift this project through time and using that lens will be one of the filters in which the selection process will happen so I take comfort in that and I, I agree with your view that that is how these projects should be looked at and as I understand it that is how it's going to happen. Okay. 
just if you uh, have a question, put your hand up uh, clearly until, yeah, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, hi team. Um, I just got a question there for Pody potentially. Um, I see you've got and developed a really awesome looking trap and it's easy to set and um, definitely good at killing your cats and your larger mustelids. Um, I was curious to think about what the spring off weight might be. Um, you know, if it's a heavy trap with a heavy set, are you potentially don't take it the wrong way, but seeding your own trapping by not catching things like uh, opportunistic mid-sized cats or kittens. Um, you're missing uh, your weasels and things like that uh, because you've got such a heavy set trap and that's the, mostly your sole focus. Yeah, no, good question. Um, when we developed the trap initially, um, our thinking was around not just specifically targeting um, large animals, although the spring set off weight is... Uh, well, the, the springs are quite powerful on the trap. They're uh, 35 kg springs each, um, so they've, they've got quite a quite a bit of punch. Um, what we managed to do was we managed to get the spring off weight on it to 85 grams, keeping in mind uh, rats as well as um, weasels and ferrets, although it's NAWAC tested for ferrets, um, and it got tested on quite a few ferrets at, at uh, 1 kg. Um, the spring off weight on that trap is 85 grams. Um, so what we've done in the trial with the Cape to City is we have a thousand of those traps on the ground at the moment and when they were produced every single one of those traps was tested off at a spring off weight of 85 grams. Um, but like any trap that's out on the field, that can, that can change over time based on the weather and what's going on out on the field. Um, but at this stage we think 85 grams is, is, is a pretty good weight to catch um, you know, rats, decent sized rats as well as everything else out there. Um, okay. I just need to note it's not it's not actually a cat trap it's a ferret mustella trap for ferrets but it, it does get cats as well. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's that's really awesome. That's totally surprising actually. I didn't expect it to get so low. Um, yeah. So how do you get on with stock knock then? Uh, stock well, that's probably one of our biggest challenges with with regards to farmland. Um, we do have trouble with young bulls. You know they they're quite curious and cows are quite curious. We put a trap on the ground, and if there's any cattle in that paddock, you guarantee two minutes later you got about 30 cows in and around your trap. Um, <laughs> sheep, no problem at all. We don't seem to have any problems with sheep uh, in farms. Um, but uh, what I'm thinking is, it's like anything, if there's something new in the environment, they're going to investigate it for a while, and they do investigate it, and they do muck around with them, and they do get triggered off. Um, but over time, once it, it becomes blended into their environment, we do find that 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 trigger uh, from stock on the field does reduce quite significantly. Um, it could take 12 months. It could take you know a couple of days. It depends on the animals and the farms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome conference and thanks for all the organisation. And um, my question two really is one is um, in your area. Do you do you know on that farm environment whether Okay, you're not you're picking up more cats, trapping more cats to mustelids, but is that the a true reflection of the population balance? And secondly, the capability of being able to step up and kill mustelids if they is that there if you knock out the cats and probably the mustelids will increase as a result? And and it just comes from a background on our own twenty hectares up on the Auckland Waikato environment. Um, we've just basically done Brody for about fifteen years and um, four or five times a year and. But I have, the last four years, I've shot 50 cats just on 20 hectares, and it's just amazed me um, how many we've trapped. And um, But we do have really high kiru counts, higher than at Mangatotri Sanctuary, and we do have long-tailed bats in a really poor bit of bush um, that has reinvasion. Um, the the long-tailed bats are as high density as the highest in the Hunuas. And so, yeah, just interested in your answer about the... Mustards versus um, cats. So, so in terms of that, um, we I think it would be fair to say we do think the actual ratio we're getting between cats and mustelids is a fair reflection of what the landscape's probably holding. Uh, we actually think there are probably quite a few more feral cats out there than there are mustelids in our farmland landscape. Um, and the reality is. Uh, and the key thing around this, in any, if you're not eradicating in any long-term sustained control program, you've always got risks and issues around bait shyness, trap shyness, and those sorts of things. Uh, so a lot of it then comes down to um, 
how sensitive and how effective are your surveillance techniques uh, for things that are survivors or things that are coming in potentially. Uh, so for us, we're placing quite a significant reliance on uh, camera tracking or uh, motion sensitive cameras uh, as a detection or surveillance technique. Um, and that's because they've got significantly increased sensitivity over the likes of tracking tunnels. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that, that that's going to get you, allow you to see everything that's in the landscape. So I think one of the areas over, over time, uh, as technology develops, uh, that surveillance and detection will become, it's important now, but it becomes increasingly important as we go into this long-term suppression and move to eradication. Hi, thank you. I've really enjoyed this conference too. I live uh, just below Shine Falls. And um, my concern going forward is how are you going to keep up the eradication? Living by Shine Falls, the cat population comes and goes um, quite regularly. And we believe, because if you say, here, kitty, kitty, sometimes they come, people are dropping cats off when they come up to the falls because they don't want them anymore. And... Um, how are you going to keep up this eradication of these large areas of which is huge up there, part of Poturi, Aotane, and we're right next to Boundary Stream going forward? And a comment to a first speaker, Boundary Stream, mainland island, wouldn't be what it is today without 1080. Eradication sounds like yeah. <laughs> So um, with any eradication, the, there's kind of two parts to it. The first part is getting rid of everything to zero, and the second part of it is then holding that at zero. And so what I'm hearing from you is that where things are breaking down is part of that holding at zero component. So in any project that is set up, if eradication is truly the goal, then that second phase is key and how you design that is key. And so in that particular environment, one of the key pathways there is people dropping cats off. And so therefore, your network that stays in behind to pick up that behavior has to be designed in that way. In places where you're in the back and beyond and people don't drop stuff off, then your network looks greatly different. So it all comes down to kind of the particulars of your site and the particular risks and pathways that are presented at your site. And so, yeah, and so they've kind of, it's all about, it's all about that really. So in this case, you've got, you know, if it's people dropping off cats, I mean, to be honest, that sounds a lot like a social problem and that's kind of a, a social answer as opposed to a technical answer on the face of it for me. Yeah, the thing is we live over an hour from Napier and um, we're down pretty much a no exit road. So um, it's like that in the rubbish. I don't know what we do, but it's compromising um, the whole program, especially being so near to Boundary Stream. Yeah, without a doubt. And again, that's where I go back to it being a social problem, which is that the, the wider community, as they buy into the project, will understand the or will it help them to understand the implications of those actions? But that's a long journey. You know, you don't change attitudes instantly, and so that also has to be built into part of that project in terms of kind of riding that out before you get to that, that end state. And there will be pain along the way, no doubt about it, but it's kind of holding that line and seeing it through is the key again, and that's kind of the critical part of an eradication is if that is the goal you set out with, that is the goal you have to go for the whole way along. Hello, um, guys. I've got a question about costs, um, Campbell and Pody, uh, on your landscape scale predator control. Um, have you got an estimate of capex and opex on a per hectare or per square kilometre basis for what these low cost landscape um, scale predator controls actually cost? So, Cam, I'm always a little bit uh, cautious when I'm talking about the cost picture at the moment, and the reason for that is really simple. Someone else brought it out uh, in an earlier question. I think we're really early in a journey on this in terms of understanding what technically is going to be possible and I think what we understand now around the costs and those sorts of things, uh, step us forward even five years, uh, we will have a very different understanding. So I think the costs will change significantly based on our change in understanding. But if you wanted to boil it down to really simple terms in our farmland context, uh, currently our farmers on average, because you're talking about 700,000 hectares and 4,500 farms roughly, uh, would pay around about two bucks per hectare per annum for possum control and maintenance. Yep. Uh, and realistically, if the cost to either 
uh, large-scale sustained predator control um, or eradication uh, in terms of holding the line and, and surveillance within the eradication area. If those costs are significantly above probably two, 250 or three bucks, I think it'll get very hard to get over the line. So we're looking at around that for a long-term sustained maintenance cost. Uh, but again, I want to caution, uh, where we are now in our understanding uh, is a very, very short way along a journey. Yep. Campbell, um, yeah, great, great project and uh, great to see the innovations. Um, your target suite of predators is not the same target suite that Predator Free 2050 have, have um, suggested. Um, you're, I'm thinking about really rats, I suppose, is the big one that's missing out of yours. Is, is that because it's a rural situation and is that sort of under the assumption that landowners will probably be doing a bit of their own baiting around that sort of thing? And I, I guess the other thing around that, when you're taking out your your cats and mustelids, um, some farmers might be saying, and I think I, I know that they did say, what about the rabbits? And then I guess also maybe what about the rats? So there's probably a few uh, comments in there. The first one I'd, I'd deal with directly would be the rat control. So in reality, we've probably gone over, and you'll, those of you coming out on Cape to City tomorrow, and even post the Altane, uh, you'll get a bit more of the detail around uh, what we're doing in the field. We haven't gone into a lot of detail around some of the control we're doing with rats, for example. Uh, so rats are on our hit list, but there's a difference. Uh, we're talking about large-scale predator control for feral cats, mustelids, uh, and possums. Uh, rat control is targeted to the site at the time of year where it's going to make the most difference for the outcome you're seeking to get. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, so rats are still on the hit list, but in a slightly different way. Yep. Uh, kia ora. Uh, Bridget Palmer from Whakatane. Uh, sort of a community engagement question for Pody, please. Um, as we head towards uh, landscape scale pest control of over 20,000 hectares in Whakatane, um, I see a lot of my role will be engaging with farmers. Um, what do you find is the, is the click for farmers, you know, different strokes for different folks? What do you find actually lights the fire in their eyes when you say, talk about pest control? You talked about that engagement earlier in your talk. What actually does it? Because we can talk to we're blue on, blue on the face about the birds and the bees and the benefits and all that, but what actually does it for them? So just so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, with regards to communication with farmers, it's about having those conversations face to face with them. And you probably find that, like everybody else, they have a story as well, you know, with regards to what's going on in their farm and what they want to happen on their farm, whether they want birds back or not or anything like that. Um, I think a good majority of them have been uh, into the idea of bringing the birds back as well. I mean, it doesn't directly impact their farming practices at all. It doesn't, uh, there's no benefit to them at all, but apart from just that feel good, um, knowing that we're doing something, you know, to help the, the environment. Um, and that certainly works, um, you know, with them. Um, and I think a lot of time needs to be spent in that space. You know, you need to have those conversations with the, with, with the landholders first and foremost before you actually look at putting anything on the ground. And uh, just building that really good relationship with, with them and maintaining that relationship. I think the worst thing is to, to start a relationship with, with them and then walk away and then have someone else take that relationship up again because then they have to build a new relationship up with a new person and all those sorts of things happen. So we're talking about 20,000 hectares. Um, in our project there's 160 farms and in amongst those 160 farms there's probably you know, two or three people on each one of those farms you have to build a really good, robust relationship. Um, and we've found that the, the hard conversations are the, probably the best ones you want to have first and foremost, and people tend to leave those to somebody else or, or don't engage with those, those types of conversations. Um, but I've certainly found that those are the ones you need to have first, uh, get those nailed, and then all the other ones will be, you know, really easy after that, definitely. But, um, you know, we can sort of have a talk about that, what we've done over the last few, few years with regards to that. Yep. Yes, uh, kia ora panel. I'm uh, from the um, Northern Hokianga and um, we're having a hard time with the um, uh, population of, um, what do you call it, uh, 
Um, uh, what do you call this place? What? Possums. The possum population in northern Hokianga. But we have uh, clear evidence of people dispersing possums from helicopters. I was just wondering if you have any evidence of this happening in any other areas around New Zealand? No. <laughs> wow. no. No. Just a question um, concerning your Cape City project um, and looking um, after the presentations sort of today and yesterday about um, aspirational goals of releasing Kiwi and things like that into that area. If you are successful, um, has anybody gauged the, um, the reaction from farmers that they'll have to muzzle their dogs or put them through Kiwi training um, once you get to that level? Has that sort of been covered off yet in any of the discussion? Um, so yes, yeah, look, a couple of things on that. The first thing is um, actually in, this, in our farmland context, without the farmer support, that stuff just won't happen. Translocations won't easily happen. There's a number of areas of uh, dock bush uh, within the farmland context are relatively small. So, um, in short, we, the one farmer that we've been speaking to about the potential for a translocation, because we're still going through the process, uh, we've absolutely talked that sort of stuff through with him, uh, both around, uh, you know, not, not just muzzling dogs, but dog aversion training, as you say, and things like that. So, the short answer is yes, when we are looking at a translocation, you have to consider the social context uh, and the implications from a farm management point of view. Uh, so that's absolutely there. Uh, the question in my mind is, um, in the end, when you come down to trying to do these translocations, clearly those birds go across potentially quite a large area. Uh, and so it's how we will uh, really smartly engage with a wide range of landowners and set up the systems for the sorts of things you're talking about across not just three or four properties. In reality, it'll be 30 or 40 or more probably. Uh, hello, um, I'm just thinking in, in our context in the Manawatu, um, and I suspect in most places in the um, country, we'll have a mix of sort of institutional land of some description, uh, dock, estate, or um, a regional reserve, uh, farmland, perhaps peri urban um, lifestyle blocks, and, and urban. And I notice in the Cape to City, um, you know, that sort of is focused on, I guess, just the institutional Cape Sanctuary and the farmland with a few small communities, but um, right on the boundary there at Hadblock North is not considered. And I, I appreciate there were reasons for that at the, at the time to not do that, but I just wonder if, if there's any plan to extend into that space in the future in terms of engaging with and getting those communities involved in backyard trapping or that sort of thing. And what, if there is a plan, what... Um, how beneficial you think that might be, and what, what are the wins that might come out of that? So I think, uh, uh, hey, really short answer is when you draw an operational boundary, you end up having to draw a line somewhere. Uh, so as you say, so that's essentially part of the reason why. Uh, but also, uh, in reality, we were testing new stuff, uh, and the social part of this picture is extremely important, uh, but you don't want to make it unnecessarily complex at the start when you're still learning yourself. Uh, so that's the other part of the reason why we didn't come deeper into some of the bigger urban areas like Havelock North and those sorts of things. Um, in terms of the future, absolutely the intention is to upscale uh, what we're doing. I mean, that's Cape to City's a project actually about providing a template uh, for how you um, do this, in our case, across our region in the farmland. Uh, so clearly we're going to upscale and clearly that will include greater urban areas. Uh, to be fair though, we are working, uh, although it's not directly in the pest control, We've absolutely, you know, got quite a strong um, education and engagement work stream. So a number of those schools around Havelock, for example, which border onto the project, Tamata and other schools there, uh, they've been closely involved in our education program. Um, so while it's not directly control related, it's engaging those communities. And that also is a springboard to uh, uh, growing things later on. A great conference. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I haven't heard mention of detection dogs. I was just wondering if they are being used or plan to be used. Uh, yeah, so in terms of our context, so I work for ZIP. Um, 
Detection dogs are a key part of the learning phase, so in terms of proving freedom from a pest and that kind of thing in the, at the small scale. We can't see how you scale it up as you go to larger landscapes and hold at zero, so we're looking at technology effectively replacing the dog, um, but as it stands right now, they would be considered right up there with our most sensitive tool, so therefore we need to use them while we learn whether our other tools that we are developing are actually working anywhere near as good as the dog. Oh, is it working? Yeah. Sorry, just one question uh, to you guys. We have been involved in the Bobcat program in Rotorua, asked by Council Rotorua, Heiko here again, sorry, uh, um, and been catching quite massive cats in the city area. So Cape to city, city is here. We caught s up to 600 cats a week, a month. There were feral cats living in the city. So um, this is a breeding point for actually bringing cats out to the nature as well. We're talking about rural cats, but we also have a lot of cat problems within the cities where people don't care, they don't host them, they don't they look after them. We've had people which had 50 cats in their backyard uh, uh, where, where these things happened. So we, we created a community issue as well, and it was well adopted, but then these cats were neutered or looked after or put down, and then they were sold to animates, which sells them back into the, the, the system. So is there any work on that one being done here at Cape? It's a huge issue. It was big, and we, we're still catching weekly, 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 and they're there. Yeah, so look, um, when I look at that context, what, what really what's happening here is, again, we talk about the system, and there's a number of parts to the system that are going to need to be successful if we're going to get uh, eradication of predator pests. Uh, so urban areas are clearly a significant part of that system uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Number one is to have the pests there. Uh, but number two, there's a whole lot of people there which can act as pathways to pests going to other areas which might have been eradicated. Uh, so in New Zealand at the moment, we actually make some, we've made some significant strides in the last uh, four years in particular around uh, cat management, both in terms of domestic, feral uh, and um, stray cats. Uh, so I think what's happening is there's uh, a point in time again in a conversation over the next four or five years, and you're starting to see it now, uh, different urban areas are saying, hey, we want to manage cats differently uh, and have the pets where we are, it's appropriate to have pets and not having the impacts where we don't want the negative effects that they can bring as ferals or those sorts of things. So uh, the short answer to your question is the urban areas are critical. Uh, as a country, we're in a conversation right now about how we're going to manage that, uh, and that's changing quite a bit. Uh, and the National Cat Management Strategy is a very good example of that, as is the conversation on um, cats over the last four or five years. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Beverly Tahui Ahau no Pakipaki Ahau, engari kei wai marama ahau e no ana. Um, my question to the panel is, is there any insight in working for the future with, into the future with Tupuni Kōkiri, as there is a, though farmers might be the farmers of the land, the land may be owned by um, or in Māori land title, and so there is significant opportunities in working with Tifuni Kōkiri in terms of um, educating Fano about ethical farming, about some of the, the this um, information going forward and when they hand over leases to farmers to actually have the influence to um, engage with farmers to practice more ethically. So in terms of Cape to City specifically as a project, uh, have we engaged directly with Tipuni Kukuri? No, we haven't. Uh, but that's certainly... Uh, and look, it's really interesting. We've, uh, despite being three years into the project, when you get to doing this sort of stuff, and those of you who are in big projects already, will know that actually the engagement context is a very, very large picture. Uh, and so it's a, it's a bit of a staged thing. Uh, so the context you're talking about uh, is important because uh, Maori multiple ownership land is important in this picture uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, there are multiple ownership blocks within Cape to City, but in most cases we're dealing with people uh, who have reasonable structures set up. Um, so yes, that's an opportunity in terms of talking to the likes of Tipuni Kokiri, uh, although we haven't done it just yet. <laughs> <laughs>